if all the properties of a type already conform to codable, then the type itself can conform to codable with no extra work. Swift will synthesize the code required to archive and unarchive your type as needed. However, this doesn't work when we use property wrappers such as at published, which means conforming to codable requires some extra work on our behalf. To fix this, we have to implement codable conformance ourselves. This will fix the at published encoding problem, but it's also a valuable skill to have elsewhere too, because it lets us control exactly what data is saved and how it happens. First, let's create a simple type that recreates a problem. Add this class to contentview.swift. Class user conforms to observable object and codable. Var name equals Paul Hudson. That will compile just fine, because string conforms to codable out of the box. However, if we make it at published, then the code no longer compiles. The at published property wrapper isn't magic. The name property wrapper comes from the fact that our name property is automatically wrapped inside another type that adds some additional functionality. In the case of at published, that's a struct called published that can store any kind of value. Previously, we looked at how we can write generic methods that work with any kind of value. And the published struct takes that a step further. The whole type itself is generic, meaning that you can't make an instance of published all by itself. But instead, you make an instance of published string, a publishable object that contains a string. If that sounds confusing, back up. It's actually a fairly fundamental principle of Swift, and one you've been working with for some time. Think about it. We can't say var names is a set, can we? Swift doesn't allow it. Swift wants to know what's in the set. This is because Swift is also a generic type. You must make an instance of set string. The same is also true of arrays and dictionaries. We always make them have something specific inside. Swift already has rules in place that say if an array contains codable types, then a whole array is codable. And the same for dictionaries and sets. However, SwiftUI doesn't provide the same functionality for its published struct. It has no rule saying if the published object is codable, then the published struct itself is also codable. As a result, we have to make the type conform ourselves. We have to tell Swift which properties should be loaded and saved, and how to do both of those actions. None of those steps are terribly hard, so let's just dive in with the first one, telling Swift which properties should be loaded and saved. This is done using an enum that conforms to a special protocol called coding key, which means that every case in our enum is the name of a property we want to load and save. This enum is conventionally called coding keys with an S on the end, but you can call it something else if you want to. So our first step is to create a coding keys enum that conforms to coding key, listing all the properties we want to archive and unarchive. So add this inside the user class now enum coding keys conforms to coding key case name. The next task is to create a custom initializer that we're given some sort of container and use that to read values for all our properties. This will involve learning a few new things, but let's look at the code first. Add this initializer to user now. Required in it from decoder decoder throws. Let container equals try decoder.container keyed by coding keys.self name equals try container.decode string.self for key.name even though that isn't much code there are at least four new things in there first this initializer is handed an instance of a new type called decoder this contains all our data but it's down to us to figure out how to read it. Second, anyone who subclasses our user class must override this initializer with a custom implementation to make sure they add their own values. We mark this using the required keyword, required in it. An alternative is to mark this class as final so that subclassing isn't allowed, in which case we'd write final class user and drop the required keyword entirely. Third, inside the method, we ask our decoder instance for a container matching all the coding keys we already set in our coding key struct by writing decoder.container keyed by coding keys.self. This means this data should have a container where the keys match whatever cases we have inside our coding keys enum. This is a throwing call because it's possible those keys don't exist. 
Finally, we can read values directly from that container by referencing cases in our enum, container.decodestring.self for key.name. This provides really strong safety in two ways. We're making it clear we expect to read a string, so if name gets changed to an integer, the code will stop compiling. And we're also using a case in our coding keys enum rather than a string, so there's no chance of typos. There's one more task we have to complete before the user class conforms to Codable. We've made an initializer so Swift can decode data into this type, but now we have to tell Swift how to encode this type, how to archive it ready to write to JSON. This step is pretty much the reverse of the initializer we just wrote. We get handed an encode instance to write to, ask it to make container using our coding keys enum for keys, then write our values attached to each key. Add this method to the user class now. Funk encode to encoder encoder throws var container equals encoder dot container keyed by coding keys dot self. Try container dot encode name for key dot name. And now our code compiles. Swift knows what data we want to write. It knows how to convert some encoded data into our object's properties and knows how to convert our object's properties into some encoded data. I hope you're able to see some real advantages here compared to the stringly typed API of user defaults. It's much harder to make a mistake with Codable because we don't use strings and it automatically checks our data types are correct.